Good morning, everyone. I'm going to spend the next few minutes before lunch telling you a very personal story. But it's my sincere hope that in this personal story, some of you at least will find something that resonates with you. And I'd like to start with a question. Just by a show of hands, how many people in the room work at least 60 hours a week? Could be school, could be your profession. Now, how many of you feel at some point you're compromising? You're trading off the things that you need to do for the things that light you up, the things that you love to do, the things that truly make you happy. Just a show of hands. There's actually a few people that aren't raising their hands, and you all owe the rest of us a little insight at the break on how you pull that off. But I can tell you that I certainly struggle with that. And it sometimes feels like that we're always on. I know I feel that way. We've talked a lot about technology this morning. I feel connected all the time. Now, in many ways, I love that. It's exciting, it's invigorating, right? But it's also challenging. It sometimes gets in the way of those things that truly give me happiness. And when we talk about happiness, it's different than pleasure. Vacations give me pleasure. I'm talking about things that are deeper than that. There's been a lot of great work done on happiness. Over the last 10 years alone, there's been some fantastic books written. And just recently, Harvard Business Review did a wonderful series of articles on happiness. One of the articles talked about productivity. In fact, the cover was about productivity. Something along the lines of happy employees are 30% more productive than average. I personally enjoyed the article more on the history of happiness, from the Enlightenment to the smiley face to our own Declaration of Independence, which offers us all the pursuit of happiness. And I'd have to say that with all this work done on happiness, you could ask a question, you know, what's the big deal? Why all the thinking about happiness? And I'm not really sure. I'm not sure if it's because we're so wired today. I'm not sure if it's because of the economy or the future prospects for the economy. But it's something that's been examined a lot lately. And I think we would all agree that going through life miserable and vindictive is no way to pursue your dreams, so happiness is a good option. Unless, of course, uh, you're an evil villain and there aren't a lot of those jobs available, so we're going to go down the happiness path. Still, I'd say that oftentimes it feels very elusive. And I love the way Benjamin Zander describes happiness. In his presentation, he looks across the audience and he talks about people whose eyes light up. In our meeting last night, I had a chance to meet several of the speakers. And a wonderful thing happens when you talk to people about things that they're truly passionate about. Their physical presence changes. Their eyes do light up. They lean in. Their voice changes you can tell that they're fully 100% engaged. As we think about how do we get to that place with all the things that are demanding our time, how do we avoid this idea of compromise? How do we at least consciously take it on? And I'd say that I think it begins with this idea of your true north. What is that thing for you? Or what are those things for you? that just can't be compromised, that are the source of your true happiness. This is my source of happiness. And when I thought about that idea of compromise, I was reminded of a quote from a good friend of mine, Jeremy Cage, who says, when it comes to our problems, we tend to think in great specificity. We run the numbers, we tumble things, we go back and forth, we look at every angle. But when it comes to our dreams, they're often ethereal or vague. So I set out on the path of how do I take this source of happiness and make sure that I have a plan so that it's not compromised. Every night when I walk home, in the door at home, um, I get these two sets of eyes that pop up. I have two boys, nine and seven. And whatever they're doing, they're reading, they're playing video games, they're doing things after school, immediately they look up and I get this in unison, Daddy! That's a happy moment. That's a great moment. 
But all too often, in about 45 seconds, they're back into their books, which I prefer, um, or their video games. They're off to something else. And I ask all sorts of questions. How was your day? How was soccer today? How was chess club? How are your friends? And sometimes I get two or three sentence answers. Those are happy moments. But usually I get a series of one-word answers. OK, sure, maybe. I often get later. And lately I get in a minute. That's the popular one right now, in a minute. And it only takes a few of those till I realize that what I'm really dealing with are not just little boys, but little cavemen. <laughs> sure, they're only nine and seven, but they've got these little caveman roots. And to get them to truly talk about themselves, I'm not going to be able to just ask them about themselves. So since there aren't a lot of mastodon hunts these days or T-Rex excursions, we go fishing. And something amazing happens when I put a fishing pole in their hands. And their eyes are now out on the water. They're away from me, not focused on really what we're talking about but we start to have these amazing conversations. Pretty deep stuff, actually, for nine and seven-year-olds. We talk about connections. Connections to God, connections to the universe, connections to each other. We talk a lot about wisdom. Occasionally, we have these great opportunities where my dad is able to join us. And he passes on these stories, and it's just so much richer coming from him than from me. And he has a way of connecting with them and knowing just what they'll react to, telling them stories like how to use bubble gum to keep gophers out of the yard. <laughs> and he tells them great fishing stories, and he tells them stories about like the time he fell out of the boat with the motor still running, and it circled him for half an hour. So wisdom comes in many forms. Sometimes the simple is just staying in the boat. We talk about curiosity, and I love this one. Why is this purple? Why does this rattle? Why is one bigger than the other one? Why do we have to get up so early? I can see in these barrage of questions their little minds just expanding second by second. It's a great thing. We talk about strategy, believe it or not. We don't use that word, but we talk about it. What are we trying to catch today? What's the wind doing? What's the water temperature? Is it spawning season? Spawning season, which leads back to curiosity, <laughs> which is an entirely different presentation. <laughs> but usually, our strategy leads to humility. We catch an awful lot more trees and rocks, and occasionally each other, than we do fish. But occasionally, it leads to achievement. And the longer and harder that we've been working, the greater the sense of achievement. And I love the story about the first fish that my oldest son caught when he had no idea what to do. But he turned around and figured it out on his own, and he couldn't have been more proud. And finally, it leads to kindness. We talk a lot about kindness. We're all God's creatures, and we talk about, in practice, kindness along the way. So as my wife and I think about how do we launch these two young boys into the world, ensuring that they have compassion, that they're productive, that they grow up as young Christian men, hopefully employable, by the way, we spend an awful lot of time thinking about how do we make sure our best energy and our best time goes to what's most important. I love this. This is just an excerpt from the end of a Chinese proverb that says, if you want happiness for a lifetime, help someone else. For me, when I watch my boys catch a fish, it gives me a lot more happiness than when I catch one. When I watch them take one more step down the path to adulthood, becoming their own person gives me great happiness. So my question for you guys today is, do any of you feel at times that you're at a fork in the road? Do you feel like you have to choose one versus the other? And if that's the case, then my challenge, if that's the right word to you, is to take the time to understand your own true north. What is it that you can't compromise? 
what is it that has to get your best energy? And find your own version of the fishing pole, the key, the thing that unlocks it for you. Your happiness is the thing that you should be thinking about. Now, if that path happens to lead you down the road of fishing, I know some good spots, so let me know. But find your path. Thank you for the opportunity to be here. Enjoy the rest of the conference.